The enormous advances in medical science within the past few decades have revolutionized the possibilities of affording detailed information on the condition of each individual patient. Information which is of diagnostic as well as therapeutic significance. The practical utilization of the theoretical gains within the disciplines of physiology, biology and pathology made such increased demands on the quality and quantity of laboratory analysis that special laboratories had to be established to provide adequate service for the clinical departments. Within the past 20 years, central laboratories have been established in practically all of the large Danish hospitals. We shall now try to give you an impression of the work which is being done in the central laboratory to illustrate the development and the way in which the organization and the practical problems of this new field are being solved. When today a patient consults a doctor and the doctor feels that a number of laboratory studies are needed to assess the condition of this case, he refers the patient to a central laboratory on an outpatient basis or, in more complicated cases, the patient may have to be admitted for elucidation. Here the patient has been admitted and the clinical investigation is being done the initial laboratory analysis are then prescribed. The nurse checks off the analysis on a numbered requisition slit, which has the same number printed on detachable gummed labels used for marking the test tubes in order to reduce the risk of mixing them up. The slip is taken to the central laboratory and placed in the box reserved for the department concerned. Blood sampling is done by the laboratory technicians in the morning. The requisition slips are arranged according to ward and the technician studies the slips to see which samples are required. The tubes used for the sampling are as far as possible disposable, delivered in a dust-free packing and thrown away after use. This greatly facilitates the daily routine and saves labor as no cleaning is needed. The tubes are now placed in a special basket with blood sampling equipment. We also use disposable needles and lancets which are available in sterile packings. The basket moreover holds sterile pipettes for drawing capillary blood cotton wool, alcohol, etc., so that the laboratory technician can go straight from the laboratory to the bed and draw the required samples without having to trouble the nurse for any equipment at all. At the bedside, the technician makes sure that the name on the requisition slip corresponds with the patient's name. The venous puncture is then carried out and the tubes are filled with blood. As a general rule, one tube for each analysis. The tubes are then marked with the numbers from the pink requisition slip.
On arrival at the laboratory, the technician sorts the tubes, placing the samples for the individual analysis or sets of analysis in the same rack. The racks are then distributed on the various workplaces as each analysis is done in a particular place. The same afternoon, the requisition slips are returned to the clinical department with the reports of those analyses which have been completed already. In case an analysis takes more than 24 hours, an extra slip has to be made out and sent to the department when the analytic result is available. The hematology laboratory receives all samples for hematological studies. For practical reasons, these studies are done on stabilized venous blood so that whenever convenient and with the same pipette, the blood may be distributed for the various analysis and staining procedures. In order not to be mixed up, the individual tubes for the analysis are marked with the pink labels from the requisition slips. To ensure that the blood cells are still homogeneously mixed in the plasma, it may be expedient to use a special mixing apparatus in which the tubes holding the blood samples slowly rotate. Here, the homogeneous blood for determination of the sedimentation rate is being pipetted off. Determination of hemoglobin is carried out in a photoelectric filter photometer. The fluid for photometry is poured through a fixed funnel into the cuvette and emptied out by means of vacuum from a water suction pump by closing with a finger. Routine daily control of this photometer is done by first adjusting to zero with distilled water in the cuvette and checking whether a staple aqueous solution of a red dye gives the predetermined deflection on a scale. If not, adjustment has to be done. When the apparatus has been adjusted, the individual samples may be read in rapid succession as the hemoglobin concentration in gram percent is printed direct on the scale. The results of duplicate analysis on each sample are entered in the records. In this, as well as in other analysis, the results are accepted only if the differences between the duplicate analysis do not exceed a predetermined value. Counting of red cells can be done quickly and accurately by means of an electronic measuring equipment. The principle of this method is that a dilution of blood in physiological saline at the ratio 1 to 80,000 is sucked through a capillary opening across which the electric resistance may be measured. When a red cell passes the opening, the resistance increases considerably and this may be recorded electronically and counted. The dilution must be so weak that only one blood cell passes at a time. The entire counting in the apparatus takes approximately 45 seconds. During this time, 40 to 50,000 blood cells have passed the opening, depending on the number present in the blood. The number of red cells in millions per microliter of blood is read direct from the apparatus.
Better reproducibility, about plus minus 2%, is obtained by this method than by counting in the usual counting chambers. A Van Slyke manometric apparatus is a standard equipment in practically every clinical laboratory throughout the world. It is employed for a large number of analyses whose final phase consists in the development or liberation of gas. The sample plus a reagent are enclosed in a special chamber by means of mercury. By further lowering the mercury, a vacuum is produced and then the chamber is shaken in order to expel the gas from the liquid. The Van Slyke apparatus is not suitable for large series of analysis for which methods based on a diffusion technique are generally quicker. Such a technique may be exemplified by the determination of urea by the Conway method. To this end, we use a glass dish divided by a concentric glass wall into an outer and inner chamber. The sample is placed into the outer chamber together with the reagent, in this case serum with urease, which splits urea, forming ammonia. The ammonia is then liberated by adding potassium carbonate and now it can diffuse in the gaseous state over the glass wall to be absorbed in the boric acid solution in the inner chamber where it is titrated. The entire system has to be closed airtight by a close-fitting lid having a hole which can also be closed airtight by a glass stopper. Through this hole, reagents can be added to the outer as well as the inner chamber. You have now seen the addition of the reagent in urea analysis and the mixing of the reagent and sample in the outer chamber during manual rotation of the dish. This brings us to the stage at which diffusion has taken place and the titration of the boric acid is to be done. The container is placed on a magnetic stirrer and hydrochloric acid of a specified normality is passed into the inner chamber until the liquid turns red. The number of microliters of hydrochloric acid which has to be added corresponds to the concentration in serum in milligrams per cent. One of our most common analyses is the determination of creatinine in serum. We sometimes do between 100 and 200 a day, and this of course requires a high degree of rationalization. The blood samples for creatinine analysis are taken to the laboratory, placed in the rack with the tubes for analysis, and the numbers on the pink labels are entered in the records. Serum is pipetted off with a so-called Carlsberg pipette, which is available in various sizes. The most commonly used sizes are from 10 to 15 microliters, up to 500 to 1,000 microliters. These pipettes are extremely accurate and comparatively quick in use. Serum is pipetted off for the simultaneous performance of two analyses on the same sample. Proteins in the sample interfere with the analysis and therefore have to be precipitated by adding sulfuric acid and sodium wolframate. For this purpose, we use semi-automatic Krog syringes which are extremely accurate and very quick. Plastic stirrers are used to promote mixing. Thereupon the tubes are centrifuged and this is done in the same place. Much time is saved by having a centrifuge at each place where centrifugation is required.
The precipitated protein has now been centrifuged down and the clear supernatant contains the creatinine to be determined. The supernatant is pipetted off and the tube is thrown away. A picrate reagent is now added. It forms with the creatinine a reddish color whose intensity is proportional to the creatinine concentration. The mixture is left in the dark for 20 minutes in order to obtain optimum color development. There is a distinct difference in color between the two sets of duplicate determinations. Finally, the color intensity is measured in a photometer. We have found it practical to use a homemade model as we intend to fit each place where colorimetric determination is carried out with such a photometer. Here too, we use a cuvette with self-emptying cells. After the advent of the photoelectric photometer, the colorimetric principle of analysis has gained enormous ground in routine analysis in clinical laboratories, as the final reading, shown here, is very quick. For purposes of analytic accuracy, it is very important that syringes and pipettes are accurately adjusted and that the adjustments are made at brief intervals. The plastic tip of the syringe is being mounted after preheating. The position of the piston in the crock syringe when the spring is at rest may be regulated by a screw device. First, the weighing glass itself is weighed on the semi-automatic balance. The syringe is filled with water and its column may be determined by emptying the water from the syringe into the weighing glass, which is then weighed again. Here, determination of bilirubin in serum is being carried out. Quite a large number of these determinations are done because the University Hospital is a therapeutic center for infants having jaundice because of rhesus incompatibility. Capillary blood is used. The tube containing the blood sample is amber colored to avoid any decrease in the bilirubin concentration caused by daylight. 25 microliters of serum are used for the determination. Various reagents are added to produce a characteristic color whose intensity is finally determined in a photometer. This is a commercial spectrophotometer without a flushing device for emptying the cuvettes. The cuvettes are in a special holder which has to be removed from the apparatus when filling and emptying the cuvettes. The setting of the apparatus is checked on a blank and then, one by one, the samples are pushed into the light beam and the galvanometer deflections are recorded. Finally, the concentration of bilirubin is calculated by means of a table.